In this brief video, I will talk you through recommendations for the use of content advice in academic settings. These recommendations are derived from our research with staff and student survivors in the arts, humanities and social sciences, but may also be applicable to other contexts. Firstly, whatever your approach is, make sure that it is one that all staff involved in delivering the material are signed up to. This includes guest lecturers and teaching assistants. We have been deliberately vague here about what constitutes a unit of learning, and there may be a need for variation within a department. For instance, different approaches may be appropriate for work-based learning modules or creative practice. This is not a problem, so long as it is clearly signalled to students. Which brings us to the second recommendation. Be clear what students can expect from you, and also what you expect from them. It's a good idea to lay out the approach clearly in program documentation. And here, it may be useful to use language that students are familiar with from popular culture, including contested terms like trigger warnings. Encourage students to share responsibility for the learning environment. So, when they're the ones presenting content, make sure that they also follow best practice. For instance, by asking them to post a descriptive title of their presentations on the virtual learning environment at least 24 hours before class. Avoid these kinds of statements, which are unhelpful, as it assumes that you know better than survivors what their needs are, and it doesn't leave open the possibility of reasonable adjustments for students who may require them. Having signalled the general approach, content advice can be presented in a simple and factual way, without warning labels. Content advice or information can benefit everyone, and it doesn't have to be aimed at a specific group. This is an example of the kind of content advice you might include in course documentation. It tells the students why they are being asked to engage with the material, and it gives basic information about the form and content. This is an example of an approach to avoid. It uses alarmist language and makes assumptions about how students might respond. Likewise, this format may be familiar from popular culture, but remember, when we are scrolling social media or choosing something to watch on Netflix, we have a range of options available to us and can choose to just scroll past or switch off. This is unlikely to be helpful in an academic context, where the material may be essential to the learning experience. It's also important to give information in a timely fashion, so students can act on it without identifying themselves. Statements inviting students to look away or leave the room may be well-meaning, but they don't allow students to prepare to engage and require students to identify themselves in the classroom. Written advice shared well in advance is a better approach and verbal advice, if used, should also be timely. It's fine to advise students of graphic content on the next slide within a lecture, but only if you've already indicated in advance that the lecture will cover this content. Content advice, if used, should be proportionate, clear, and crucially, scalable. A short factual description of key topics in the reading or lecture or to be discussed in the seminar is sufficient. Think about signaling the form that this material will take, as well as the content. If you are using media in a context where that won't necessarily be assumed, say so. But don't state the obvious. So if your course is a course on gender-based violence, you don't need to state this every week. At the same time, be alert to assumptions about cultural capital. Don't assume that everybody knows something about course content, but don't overload students with information. This can become like the warning on a cigarette packet that is just not seen. Finally, it's important to make sure that you signpost additional forms of support and information. This should include ensuring that mechanisms for seeking reasonable adjustments, 
for those for whom that is required, are clearly signposted. And of course, requests for reasonable adjustments must be respected. You should also share information about support that is available within your organisation and beyond. If you are based at Strathclyde, the Helping Students in Distress Guide is a useful starting point here. Make sure students know where to find this information and that it is regularly checked and updated. So, in summary, these are the five key principles to consider. Consistency, clarity, timeliness, proportionality and effective signposting. We hope you have found these recommendations helpful and we wish you luck in implementing them.